Hello everyone, I am Grandmaster Priyadarshan Kanapan and welcome to 21 Gems of Chess. So this is a show that is partnered by Chess Gyan Academy and Follow Chess app. And 21 Gems of Chess is a series where we bring to you players who had so good chess qualities and you know talent but they fell short of becoming a world champion. So now we are on day 17 of our 21 day series and we have been talking about various chess legends and today we are going to be talking about Grandmaster Laszlo Sabo. So there is a connection between the Grandmaster whose game we are talking today and the previous two legends or twin gems whom we talked about. So if you go back and check day 16 and day 15, day 16 would be on Lajo Sportish and day 15 would be on Alexander Kortov. So if you see the player who is playing against Zabo today, it is caught off. So we have a connection between the two players right away. So the player whose gem we talked about two days ago is now on the losing side this time uh, as playing as the black pieces. And what is the connection between Zabo and Portish? So both of them, if you do notice, played for Hungary. That's the first connection. And the second connection between Portish and Hungary, uh, Portish and Zabo is that Zabo was the leading player of Hungary till you know Lajos Portish broke into the chess scene in a big way. So Portish is like the successor of Zabo in Hungarian chess field, and Zabo is considered to be one of the top ten players in the world in his peak of his chess career. And Zabo played three times in the candidates, and he also had one nine times the Hungarian championship for the, and he won the, for the first time in 1935 when he was just at the age of 18. And another fun fact or a tidbit about Zabo is that uh, Zabo, like you know, during the World War II, he was captured by the Russian army and he was a prisoner of war. So that kind of stopped his chess career for a certain period of time. And then later on, he, when he came out of prison, then, you know, his chess continued after that. So. These are the basic information about Grandmaster Laszlo Zabo and we'll be looking at the game that he played in 1949 in a Moscow Budapest match. So I believe Zabo represented the Hungarian side so he was playing for the Budapest team and Kotov representing the Moscow side played for the Rush you know the Moscow team Kotov. So before we go further into the game and you know look at the game I just have a announcement to make to the audience. So there is an online tournament organized by Chess Gyan Academy and you can see the prospect is over here. It's on 13th April and the total price money is 56,000 Indian rupees. The time control is 4 minutes with 1 second increment, 9 rounds and we have close to 20 re title players registered so far. That includes international masters and grandmasters and we do expect few more title players to register. So it's going to be a very strong tournament where uh, you can also win, have a you know chance to win prizes as we are giving 40 prizes plus one prize for the Cheskyan Academy student. So you have in total 41 prizes. So you have a good chance of playing strong plays and also win a prize at the same time. So if you are interested in how to register, you can contact the numbers that we have given below and we will be very glad to help you on the registration process. So now let's get back into the game. So Zabo was a kind of an aggressive player, attacking player and honestly when uh, I was thinking of whose game should we choose today, I my first choice or thought was not to go for Zabo's game but how I chose Zabo has actually an interesting story behind it. So yesterday as we were talking about Portish you know I was going through Hungarian chess and uh, some of the chess in general about Hungary and that's when I was like okay so let's do some research on Zabo and that's how I uh, decided on Zabo being the gem for today. So Zabo starts the game with d4 and Zabo generally preferred d4 more than e4. If you see his database, you would see d4 being higher played, more percentage of games played with d4 than e4. Kotov responds with knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3 and d5. And I think this is a dubious move. Well, is Grunfeld not the most popular move against d4? I mean, how is Grunfeld dubious? Am I calling Grunfeld a dubious opening? No, not at all. But Grunfeld is a very good opening, but I think against Zabo it may have been a wrong opening choice. The reason is, 
when I was going through the games of Sabo, I realized that he had a huge liking to get strong centers. In the games he won, if you do notice, there's a clear pattern that all his games he had very strong centers. He loved getting control of the center. And what is Grunfeld as opening? It is giving control of the center to the opponent and trying to strike back. So I feel from that perspective, it was a wrong strategy and not a wrong move, DeFi going into Grunfeld. And Zabo went knight f3, bishop g7, queen b3. Not so often, I mean, you generally see CD5 followed by e4 setup. Queen b3 is not as popular as that setup. And for queen b3, black played d takes c4. So instead of dc4, there's another option for black, which is to go c6 and try to play it like a Slav setup kind of. And if c takes d5, black has two options, take with a knight or capture back with a pawn. If he captures back with a pawn, which I think is the inferior of the two captures, white can go bishop g5, threatening bishop takes f6, and then, you know, trying to capture on the d5 pawn. So black goes knight c6, put some pressure on d4 pawn, white goes e3, e6, bishop d3. And I kind of like white's position. It seems to me that this bishop is going to be pretty terrible, and uh, black is going to have some issues on where he's going to put the bishop. So for these reasons, I like white's position here. For c takes d5, black could capture with the knight. And now if white goes e4, black can play knight takes c3, b takes c3, shot castle and go bishop to a3. So here white's idea is fairly standard. White stops c5 pawn push, pawn break, or an e5 pawn break, which is the most you know logical pawn breaks that black has in Grunfeld setup. So in the game, uh, after bishop a3, it would lead to an unclear position. Black, I think, may go rook e8 and then try to go knight d7, e5 kind of moves. That's one possibility. Or go knight d7 directly. So these are kind of some of the ideas for black. And so let's get back into the game. So for the fifth move, queen b3, black responded with d takes c4, queen takes c4. And here, black shot castle, which is the most popular and the most logical move. But as the theory has developed extensively over a period of time in these systems, right now there is an interesting try that has been played quite a few times and that is bishop e6. The point of it is after queen b5, black is actually sacrificing the pawn on b7 because black goes bishop d7, queen takes b7, knight c6, queen b3, rook b8, queen d1, bishop f5, a3, Shot castle, e3, e5, and black, I think, has enough compensation for the sacrifice pawn, and black has a huge lead in development. And one of the points to note is, we have to see on move 10, we come back queen d1 to the starting square. So how many queen moves did white go? First, from queen d1, white went to queen b3, then it captured on c4, then it went to b5 as a check, then it captured on b7, then it went back. So that's one, two, three, four, and fifth move it came back, and sixth move it came back to starting position. So the first 10 moves, six were played by the queen. And in, at the end of the six turns, the queen just came back to where it started, but it had captured a pawn. I think that's too much of a time that's being spent to capture a pawn, and black should be able to generate enough counterplay. For example, when black went bishop f5, one of the key ideas for black is to go knight b4 followed by knight c2, and that is why you see white going moves like a3, which is actually further slowing down the development as white is making pawn moves. So this is an interesting try for black with bishop e6 on move 6. So for queen takes c4, black shot castle and white went with e4. So now white has got a very, you know, large expanded center. And here black actually has seven critical tries that have been played by strong players, you know, notable players. And uh, some of those continuations, let's see, the most popular is obviously to go a6. Idea of expanding on the queen side with b5 and kind of putting pressure on the center via the flank attack with a6. So this is the most popular move in the position. Knight a6 have been played in quite a bunch of games. This is the second most popular move. Bishop g4, which is played in the game, is, was, is also a popular move. And then there are other variations include or continuations include knight c6, c6 on seventh move, knight fd7 or bishop e6. So these are the different continuations. I feel a6 is the best and the most popular move. That's why it's, I think because it's the best move, that's why it's the most popular move I feel like. Black went bishop g4 in the game, which I would consider it as a dubious move. The reason being when 
uh, I don't play Grunfeld from white or uh, black. So when I was looking through this setup, I felt like white actually got very good position in any variation you chose after bishop g4. So black really did not have a clear path to complete equality in any variation that I found after bishop g4. So bishop g4 I feel is a dubious move and white just goes bishop e3 strengthening his center. And the important point to note is white is not just looking to short castle. I mean, if white was planning to short castle, white would be very worried about something like bishop f3, g f3, and then there's no g pawn, you know, if he short castles. But white is always open to long castling ideas also in these positions. So for bishop e3, if black plays bishop takes f3, which I would consider as a dubious move, mainly because it actually helps white strengthen the center further because e4 pawn is now well protected by f3. And at some point, white can go f4 kind of even expand on the center squares. So knight fd7, rook d1 would be a plus equals position. So for bishop e3, black goes knight fd7. The point of it being black wants to kind of, you know, use this bishop, put some pressure here, is going to go knight b6 and then go knight c6 and put maximum pressure on the d4 pawn by the knight on c6, bishop on g7 and the queen on d4. So noticing this, white goes queen b3, voluntarily he's pulling back his queen because knight b6 was going to come anyway. And here c5 is a try that has been quite a, played quite a few times in the game though black went knight b6. If c5, white would go d5, and if knight a6, bishop e2, and the two grandmasters whose game popped up more often in this particular position was Grandmaster Vlastmil Babula and Vladimir Epishin. So I would like to believe they are an expert in this setup, particular setup for the white side, so you should study their games if you are interested in playing these kind of positions. So for bishop e2, if rook b8, short castle, you know, b5, and uh, I, think I, I would give it as a plus equals position here. So for ninth move queen b3, black went knight b6 in the game and white can long castle if he wants to. Black would go a5, a3, a4, queen c2 and there are a lot of strong games that you can check in your database. Instead white played rook d1. So white kind of now cannot castle long also. I mean that option doesn't exist anymore. So what is white's idea with the king? Is he going to keep short castle? I mean that's still theoretically a possibility because black has not committed bishop f3 though so the king can feel very safe on g1 if white simply goes bishop e2 next move and then short castles. But in case of black goes bishop f3 g f3 then I feel white can even be happy keeping the king in the center of the board. The reason being even though the king is kind of weak if your opponent cannot exploit it then it's okay to keep you know keep the king in the center of the board. So for rook d1 black goes knight c6 white pushes d5 knight e5 bishop e2 and knight takes f3 g f3. So here is a very critical decision for black to make in my opinion because the opening phase is kind of coming to an end we are transitioning into the middle game phase and the question is where should black put his bishop because the bishop is under threat now and either he can go bishop h5 you know keeping some pressure on the f3 pawn he can go bishop h3 stopping white from short castling or he can maybe go bishop d7 or bishop c8 i wouldn't be uh, even considering bishop c8 as a move it's, as it seems very passive and kind of pulling back but bishop h5 bishop h3 bishop d7 or the most i would consider if i don't know what to play here if i wasn't prepared uh, for this position so let's uh, i would suggest the viewers to pause the video here you know calculate out the variation and see what you would play and once you're convinced of the move then you know continue watching the video here so here black went bishop h3 in the game so you know he wants to stop white from castling i believe or to go some sort of king f1 but this is actually a dubious move kind of mistake the best move for black would have been to go bishop to h5 which will come later first we'll discuss why bishop d7 is even terrible than bishop h3 bishop d7 is absolutely terrible because white simply goes h4 and is threatening to go h5 and attack on the h5 if bishop h3 or bishop h5 was there you know this h4 move would not have been so dangerous that's the key difference so for bishop d7 h4 if black goes c6 white goes h5 c takes d5 h takes g6 h takes g6 and e takes d5 so all white next is going to do is going to play queen b4 and swing the queen to h4 and deliver a checkmate or a big attack on the black king and the, there, there was a game played between Eric Kestlik and Masoni in Budapest 2012. We have another Hungarian connection because this game was a match 
the match the game we are seeing was a match between Moscow and Budapest and the game that I just mentioned Kestlik Nasconi was played in Budapest in Hungary in 2012 and in that game black and bishop f8 queen b4 rook c8 queen h4 and you know white like just basically checkmating the black king so bishop h5 would have been the best move but this was not played by black and for this what should white do is a big question i mean so now h4 is not a very great move because h5 is impossible so how should white proceed here should white go something like f4 or should do white something else and i feel white should go rook g1 here the idea of rook g1 is kind of you know put some pressure down the g file but what pressure i mean there's a such a solid pawn on g6 the pressure is going to be mainly after white goes f4 and goes some sort of f5 and try to break through on the king side. So once that happens, you know, the rook on g1 would exert tremendous amount of pressure on the g5. And as I earlier mentioned, white is actually happy just keeping this king on the center of the board as there's no clear way black can attack the white king right now. So for this reason, rook g1 and, uh, you know, white's doing great. It's a plus equals at least position on the board. So black went bishop h3 and bishop h3 is dubious because the same rook g1 idea and now rook g3 comes with a attacking kind of you gain a tempo attacking the bishop on h3. So for rook g1 black went queen d6 and this was kind of the novelty or a new move back in the day till this point that had been previously played games and I think the game that was played before this before 1949 this game was I think went queen c8. In this game, uh, black went queen d6. If queen c8, white can simply play f4 with the idea to play f5 and kind of isolate the h3 bishop or first go rook g3 and then go f5 and then pick up the bishop on h3. So for queen d6, which was a new move back in the day in 1949, white simply plays f4. So the point is white can go rook g3, but there's no need for rook g3 here right now. Because the main idea of queen d6, obviously, I mean, h2 pawn is under threat. So you have to either go rook g3 or f4 and stop black from capturing on h2. But there's no need for rook g3 because black would just drop back with his bishop. And after you go f4, black would try to break the center with e6. And I feel like black is kind of doing okay. I mean, black is not... Uh, completely equalized yet but black isn't very much worse also I would say because once the center slowly chips away black can kind of start defending so because of this white goes f4 directly and now black goes c6 the point being now white well okay the question is what would white do now I mean black is trying to chip away the center cd5 is a very kind of a real threat coming up and uh, we know that white's position looks you know from a aesthetic sense and if you just have a feel for the position it looks very good for white but how to proceed further what would you do you know i would suggest the viewers pause the video calculate some variations and see how you can increase your advantage as white and then proceed watching the video so in this position uh, this is a white played a4 this move is good enough to you know keep the advantage even increase it a slightly bit than what he has but white actually had a very strong move here white could simply capture d takes c6 and after queen takes c6 go f5 so this bishop's escape square uh, you know is blocked now d7 square is inaccessible and if black goes something like bishop e5 stopping white from going rook g3 which would be the white's plan to trap the bishop on h3 white can simply go knight d5 and after knight takes d5 rook takes d5 bishop h2 white simply goes rook h1 and blacks one of the bishops will fall and black is in big trouble and this is just a straightforward resignation basically i think black should do here so in the game though white played a4 it's not a bad move it actually has some good ideas with a5 but i feel it was unnecessary to just all of a sudden play on the queen side also white could have just kept it simple with dc6 so for a4 black went bishop c8 because white said that was a5 and also kind of pick up the pawn on b7 but you can see bishop c8 then it shows reflects how poor black's position is right now and white goes a5 knight d7 d takes c6 Queen takes c6 and knight to d5. So white lands his knight on this critical square. White still has the majority of central control. I mean black actually has absolutely zero central control right now. And after knight d5, let's say if black was rook e8, the position is so bad that you can, you know, you can see a sample variation that white will go bishop b5, queen d6, e5, queen b8. I mean look at how sad 
the queen is on b8 and white simply goes queen c4 with a threat to go knight c7 and black is going to lose a lot of material i mean literally everything is hanging for black and black pieces have zero scope to create any sort of play here so for knight d5 on move 19 black simply went king h8 because black realized that he cannot defend the e7 pawn but black is at least hoping that if white captures the pawn you know that would take some time for black to maybe try to consolidate his remaining of pieces so this is a very key kind of aspect that what black is trying to show here so when you are defending and you are very passive some it's good sometimes uh, majority of the times if you can just give sort of a small bait like a small material and that if your opponent kind of goes after it tries to go and you know get the bait in the meantime you can fix your other problem so you'll be materially down maybe one pawn down or an exchange down but all the structural issues or long-term issues you had maybe like un, you know undeveloped pieces or weaking if you can fix all those in exchange for small material you, you know it's a great trade-off and in such cases if you are playing uh, the side which already has the advantage uh, you should be very careful if you want to convert your you know long-term advantages into material advantages in this case white does convert into material advantage with 97 but then it's not like he loses all his other advantages like you know strong center and so on uh, so for 97 black goes queen c7 black is threatening queen a5 and white plays a very simple but very powerful move i really like this move from a human perspective he just goes queen to b4 its the idea is not mainly to defend a5 but it is to keep an eye on this f8 rook and also to, to threaten bishop d4 and then you know kind of bring the queen to d4 after the bishop gets exchanged so the queen would be on the most powerful diagonal aiming at the black king so for queen b4 black tries to generate play he goes b6 White goes bishop d4. As I said, white doesn't really care about the a5 pawn. White is clearly going after the black king right now. And black goes knight c5. White goes knight d5. Queen b7. A takes b6. A b6. Knight takes b6. So here, something like knight e4 would just be terrible because white can play queen f8 and checkmate. So here, for knight e6, bishop takes g7 check. King takes g7, f5, rook b8, queen c3 check. This is the game continuation we are following right now. And after f6, white simply goes knight d5. So if you look at it from the more 28th more knight takes e7, white has multiple ways to win. So you may have found some other flashy way to win or something or some other variation. I'm just not going into those variations because it's, the position is so good that many moves win for white. So it's not like only the moves that was played by Zabo or the good one. So if you had found uh, another winning line, it may be even better than this possibly. So now let's get back to queen c3 check where we left. And after f6, white goes knight d5, knight d8, and white just simply captures on fg6, hg6, and goes bishop h5. And black cannot defend g6 in any good way. And if he goes something like g5, white can just even play rook takes g5. So black uh, resigned in this position. So this was actually a no contest. I mean, black was never in the game. And black, the moment he came out of the opening phase, he was already in big trouble. And uh, clearly a one-sided game. And it was a very impressive uh, show by Zabo. And uh, as, uh, I mean, Koto is not random in his any player i mean he's a legend right and to uh, for a legendary player like caught out to have no chance in a game means that it was a very strong powerful performance by zabo and as i earlier mentioned at the start of the player profile of zabo i mentioned uh, that grandmaster zabo loves to play attack in chess and i think you can connect that point to another point that i mentioned about him that he loved to have strong centers so generally when you control the center you know in a very strong effective manner you can easily translate that into many different advantages and one of that is to start or generate an attack against the opponent's king and this game is one such example so for example if you see around move let's say move 11 or 12 after d5 white just has the center but then all of a sudden you see around move like seven let's say seven moves later or eight moves later 
let's look at move 19 11 to 19 is 9 8 moves later white gets knight d5 with ideas of f5 and so on and black is unable to do really any sort of defense for example black would maybe even considering to may play a move like bishop f6 if possible i mean it's not a good move because white can go rook c1 or anything but one good advantage of having the center is white can even consider playing e5 and push the bishop away so this is what uh, is the great thing about controlling you know tremendous amount of squares in the center is that you can easily generate a lot of initiative and attack against your opponent's pieces and king so a very powerful game a masterpiece i would say uh, a bit one-sided but that is fine i mean we kind of can learn the concept of how uh, valuable center is controlling the center and uh, i'm pretty sure uh, if you know anyone who actually says it's not a big deal to have control center you can show them this game and explain to them how important center control is. So that's the game of Grandmaster Zabo Laszlo against Alexander Koto from a match played between Moscow City and Budapest in 1949. So I'm Grandmaster Priyadarshan Kanapan and from Chess Gyan Academy and this uh, video and series 21 Gems of Chess is brought to you by Chess Gyan Academy and Follow Chess app. So if you are interested in watching the previous 16 gems, this is the 17th gem. So if you are interested in watching the 16 gems, you can watch them in the PGN format in Follow Chess app. And if you are interested in watching the video part of it, you can watch them in the Chess Gyan YouTube channel. All the videos are uploaded there. So we still have few more days and a few more Legends games that we need to cover. So I'm really looking forward for the upcoming days of session. And uh, everyone stay safe, stay home. And before you, you know, log off, I have a big announcement that I made even at the start of the show. There's an online tournament that I'm hosting as part of my academy on you know april 13th it's on 8 p.m indian standard time of the total cash price of fifty six thousand. so don't forget to play in the tournament and get experience of playing strong players like we have close to 20 title players right now registered and also have a real big chance to win prizes as we are giving 41 prizes in the tournament so that's the big announcement i have so uh, thanks everyone for joining us joining today and uh, i'll see you all tomorrow with a different grandmaster and this legendary game bye bye everyone